Good evening, uh, welcome to the Satwa project. Um, open heart, open mind, the official online platform of the Satwa project. First of all, on behalf of uh, the Satwa project, I would like to express our thankfulness to our stream guide sponsor and media partners, Durian ASEAN and Durian FM. And not to forget also the important man behind the scene our broadcast director brother chong thank you very much for your generous contribution and kind efforts hi brother chong would you like to say hi to everyone hi everyone very good evening and thank you for joining in our broadcast today please uh, remember to like and share so that more people can benefit this evening and for those watching later in youtube please do subscribe and like as well and now back to you rob Thank you, Brother Chong. Um, we are going to have a very meaningful uh, dialogue uh, on uh, it's um, part of the daily Dharma series and uncommon dialogue between Buddhist meditative traditions, how to meditate correctly, shunyata, and its view, meditation and action. So uh, the, today's session will be divided into three parts. One will be the introduction followed by the actual dialogue and then uh, we will conclude by um, dedication at the end so um, uh, let me go direct uh, to the um, speaker's profile so as uh, I have been advised that Kenpo have very limited time so um, first is um, uh, okay of course it's myself you know I'm a programmer and uh, I'm the moderator for today and um, uh, I have been facilitating few uh, sessions and did some interpreter jobs um, uh, with focus on the Buddhist field and um, so and then I will introduce the, the speakers today um, first will be Kenpo Sonam Sewang he graduated from the uh, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies in Varanasi and also studied at Nam Doling Monastery at the Najur Nyingma Institute which he was enthroned as a Kenpo in uh, 2011 he has trained all pervading melodious sounds of thunder. He has translated, I'm sorry, the outer liberation story of Tertan Minjur Dorje together with Judith Am Amtsis and is currently working on a new translation of Long Chenpa's treasure treasury of peace instructions. He travels extensively with Kenchen Pema Shara Rinpoche serving as his translator. Welcome, Kenpo. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, nice. Next will be, yes, our Venerable Myung um, An Sunim, or I will refer to him as Venerable Sunim in short. Venerable Sunim, usually called Sunim, of course, was born in, to a Chinese family in Malaysia in 1959. He received his education in, in the UK, culminating with an MBA and worked in finance. Venerable Sunim began his meditation practice in 1992 after meeting his Zen master, Sun San, in Hong Kong. He was ordained as a monk in 1997 and spent the next 16 years in Korea doing intensive meditation retreats. He received Inca, the authorization to teach Kong Ans and lead retreats from two Zen masters in 2015. 
Venerable Sunim has over 30,000 hours of meditation experience, teaches mindfulness and Zen in Penang and internationally. His teaching approach combines the wisdom of the ancient teachers with the science of meditation to arrive at ways of practice that are well suited to our contemporary lifestyle. Welcome, Venerable Sunim. Hi, good evening. It's good to see you again. And next nice is, to see you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Giuliano Giustarini. Uh, he is actually a, also a friend of mine. He has a PhD in uh, Indological Studies uh, from the University of Turin and an MA in Indian Religions and Philosophy is from La Sapienza, University of Rome. Lecturer at the International PhD Program in Textual Buddhist Studies at the Mahidol University and also a translator and lecturer at the Fondanzion Maitreya Project. Welcome, Professor Giuliano. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to, uh, good evening, good afternoon and good morning, depending on uh, where people are now. Yes, okay, so um, we will begin the dialogue. Um, maybe our last time we were discussing about um, uh, what is sh Shunyata and uh, the, of course, we didn't go so much into the, the medita meditation aspect. And I believe today um, each uh, on honorable speakers have um, their slight, uh, kind of slideshow or presentation. So maybe I could um, invite um, uh, Kenpo to present uh, his material first. Uh, Kenpo. Hello. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, last time um we had a discussion on the um the view of emptiness uh from the different tradition and discussion we had a very fruitful discussion and uh for me it was a very good learning experience to meet with uh, uh, uh the presenters and uh, also to share my own kind of understanding uh on this vast, very vast subject of emptiness. It's not a very easy subject, uh, most complicated and profound and complex. Uh, so this time, I think uh, in this session, uh, I have kind of uh, selected one, uh, a short text. Actually, it's kind of quite long according to this session, but I would like to keep it, keep, keep it simple. Um, I will read out some of the passages and um, uh, and just to share like how um, one can meditate upon emptiness uh, from the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So the text, the name of the text that I'm going to share is actually the uh, wheel of the wheel of analytical meditation that thoroughly purifies a mental activity and uh, it is being composed by uh, Mifam Rinpoche, uh, a 19th uh, century Tibetan scholar, uh, particularly from the Nyuma tradition. So I think in this text, uh, Mifam Rinpoche touches a step-by-step -step approach to how one can uh, meditate upon Shunyata. Um, the interesting thing is like uh, we don't just right away jump into emptiness, meditation of emptiness, but uh, first we meditate on the multiplicity, then we meditate on impermanence, then followed by the suffering nature, and then we come to the selflessness, uh, which is none other than emptiness. So it's quite kind of uh, systematic and it's very uh, easy for anyone who really wants to uh, practice on emptiness. And uh, I think it's, it's very, 
simple um, yet profound uh, with not too many kind of scholarly kind of uh, discussion on the complicated actually in complex and profound uh, uh, view actually on emptiness. Uh, so very practical, like how, how do we start to uh, meditate on emptiness? So I think in, uh, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, two main kind of meditation uh, system actually are there. And the, the first one is analytical meditation. So analytical meditation is like it in, involves using one's um, thought process, using one's mind, using one's reasoning, and then uh, but using that on uh, these different topics which related to, which which are related to which ultimately leads to the meditation on emptiness. So that's uh, more or less, it's like uh, analytical meditation, but more or less like uh, what we call the contemplation. So we contemplate on that. And then, you know, uh, once we develop that, uh, uh, some kind of certainty and familiar familiarity in that meditation, then we kind of, when we come to certainty and then, we abide in that and that is what we call the single pointed meditation the abiding meditation uh, so to say so uh, the text itself is kind of uh, um, divided into three main sections what is first is how to meditate and then the second one is the measure of progress and then mm -hmm. the third one is the significance of the pr practice so how to meditate you know starts with a multiplicity uh, multiplicity is looking into one's own uh, aggregates whether one's body and then uh, the form then sensation followed by sensation and then followed by perception formation and consciousness or the mind uh, so the the first thing is um, reflecting or contemplating on the multiplicity of our body. So normally what happens is like when we talk about our body, we, we always have this presumption or an assumption that we think always think of this body as a one solid entity. And that is the biggest obstacle. Actually, that is actually not uh, what is the reality. Even though the skanda, the form, is multiple it has many aspects it has like if you go into the whole makeup of the body it's like there are thousand things in it you know so we hardly kind of uh usually we hardly kind of think on those terms we take this body as one you know a single entity and that actually uh is what we call ignorance of not knowing the true nature of our body so how does one actually dwell, uh, dwell on the, contemplate on the multiplicity? So Mifan Muse starts to write, imagine someone who stirs in you intense attachment and consider them now present vividly before you, separate this person into five component skandhas and begin by investigating the physical body. So first we bring in an object of desire, an object of um, attachment, because in the desire realm, the one of the most kind of uh, uh, gross and most uh, powerful form of desire is the sexual desire or sensual desire and the attraction or uh, attraction to the from the male's perspective for the female's body and female perspective over the male's body and so forth. So therefore, like what we do is we, when this attachment arises, what we normally think is that this person, the object of desire, object of attachment to be one single entity, one solid entity, one substantial entity. And that's why there's a very strong attachment to it. So in order to, uh, um, in order to deal with that attachment, 
what is important is to know the multiplicity of the object of attachment. So we investigate, we bring in, mentally bring in the object of attachment before us, and then we consider one by one. So Mifarmuche further writes, consider all its impure substances of flesh and blood, bones, marrow, fat, internal organs, limbs and organs of sense, pieces, urine, bacteria here, nails and the like, and the components of earth and other elements. Think of all these aspects, each of which still can be divided even further and then down to the very tiniest particle, mentally dissect them all stage by stage, checking whether you feel desire for each in turn. So that's the dismantling of looking deep into what is the physical makeup of our body, of the object of attachment. Now here, particularly bringing in the object of attachment uh, of others' body upon whom one is attached. So then considering the whole makeup of that body, what constitutes body in all these internal organs and so forth, we dissect them to the minutest particle. And then from that, what we actually come to know is um, there are multiple, the body is multiple. The multiplicity is the reality, not the singularity. So further, since there is nothing we could call body, apart from this, these substances, varied and impure, a body is just like an unclean contraption, a field of grass, wall of bricks, mounds of waste, or a mass of bubbling foam. Seeing this fact, sit and consider it mindfully. Once the momentum of this insight fades, turn to feelings, perceptions, formations, and consciousness, and look into their nature by dividing them into their various aspects. When you see them as insubstantial like bubbles, a mirage, a planting tree, or a magical illusion, you will understand how in these two there is nothing to which one could ever be attached. Continue with this thought until it fades. Then once it, it does, do not try to prolong it but turn instead to another investigation. So once we have uh, contemplated on the multiplicity of the body, of other's body as well as one's own body, then uh, further, like not only the form, but also the second skanda, which is, which is sensation or the feelings, and then move on to perception, formation, and consciousness. So in that way, one actually comes to know that the multiplicity, the reality of our body, or the form then so that's kind of uh, the first step of contemplation then the next one is impermanence reflect deeply on how these ink aggregates which are impure and lack real essence do not remain once they have arisen but perish from one moment to the next so uh, now before our focus is more on multiplicity now the focus is more on how they change. Then when we talk about change, then how the body change. And, and you know, scientifically said that the body actually, uh, is, which is made up of thousands and millions of, uh, millions and billions of cells, which actually die every moment and they arise and they kind of new cells arise and old cells die and so forth. So each and every moment, you know, they are always changing. So that aspect of the uh, the impermanent the changing nature of one's body that again followed by uh, perception formation uh, feelings and then consciousness all these kind of like both the levels of uh, impermanence whether it is gross or subtle impermanence that needs to be reflected upon again and again so then that will actually help us know um, all the civilizations of and societies of the past met with only destruction in the end and so will those of today and ages yet to come the nature of the condition can aspire inspire disenchantment so in this way we actually come to know the impermanent changing fleeting nature of all the conditioned phenomena the five aggregates of one 
not only of oneself but also of others the world that we live in the world that we live in the surrounding and then our body our consciousness everything kind of like subject to change so this contemplation help us to know the not only the multiplicity we already reflected this particular contemplation will help us the changing know and also realize the changing nature of our body the world that we live in and not only of us but also of the aggregates of others then we move on to the third contemplation which is suffering then consider how within each of the aggregates which are momentary and consist of many aspects there are experiences we might describe as pain itself and those that seem pleasant until they change yet they pro all provide the cause for future woes and thus the skandhas are are the basis of suffering reflect as well as much as you are able on all the misery there is within the world now now this is now we move on to the third contemplation which is the suffering nature and then suffering nature we in terms of understanding dukkha then we need to understand the three different types of dukkha which is the suffering of suffering which is the physical and emotional pain that we go through and then the suffering of change which actually relates to the pleasure the sense pleasures that we have which are subject to change and then both of these uh, you know based on the conditioned suffering that is the per all pervasive suffering so bring in the understanding bringing in the understanding of the three levels of suffering and then from that we uh, come to know and understand and realize the suffering nature of all the conditioned phenomena then the fourth one is that the main one so that come to after these three preparatory kind of contemplation then we come to the selflessness or the anatta uh, contemplation or meditation finally investigate these aggregates which have many aspects are and are impermanent and whose suffering nature has now been shown and look for what it is what it is that we call i now the search for the where is the i that we hold on to so strongly where is it whether this it, whether it is in the form in the feelings in the perception in the formation or in consciousness so when that inquiry is done mm -hmm. done then what we will see is we won't find the eye that we hold on to do so strongly and then when we understood that that there is no i as such the way it kind of exists does not exist in the way that we feel it to exist so therefore um then we kind of move i mean like uh, the uh, contemplation ne needs to be done on not only the 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 nature of the i nature of the person or the individual but also expand it to all the nature of all the phenomena and that comes what we call the uh, selflessness of all phenomena so that's kind of involves what we call the contemplation or the meditation upon the selflessness of uh, individual as well as selflessness of phenomena so So think in this way say to yourself in the past i would always get caught in my mistaken ideas and attitudes which led to all kinds of useless speculation but now i will consider only this instead so in that way like come to know that how far we are deluded so far because of delusion we have been circling in some uh, circulating in samsara from one form of existence to the other form of existence so in that way like then after this contemplation when we get tired yet if you find yourself getting tired yet notice that affliction do not arise even without your applying the antidote then rest in equanimity to refresh your mind so that's kind of like uh when through the contemplation through the meditation when you when one experience that the negative emotions uh fades or they do not arise then you don't need to apply again antidote but remain in this equanimity 
So that's kind of a very, very simple kind of way of meditating, which, which I, I think like very understandable and every, everyone can follow. Um, so let's move on to the measure of progress. Eventually, through familiarity with this practice, you will naturally appreciate how everything included within the five skandhas and the condition is manifold, which is multiplicity, impermanent, painful, and devoid of self. Even without any deliberate effort, the whole of your experience will seem magical and insubstantial, and you will overcome the kleshas. When it is free from the waves of afflictive emotions, the ocean of your mind is made serene and calm. This is conducive to main, main, gaining mental self-control through which one reaches the samadhi of calm abiding. So it's kind of, normally we talk about developing shamatha before vipassana, but here vipassana, through vipassana, through seeing the reality, then we can subside the negative emotion as a result of which the samadhi of calm abiding can be developed. So there are two ways normally explained in the scriptures, like before we doing vipassana, uh, first developing shamatha, and then uh, going on to vipassana. But here it's more like analysis, which really kind of uh, uh, help us develop insight into reality, and that actually help us the reach the samadhi of calm abiding. If you can then look into the very identity of the mind in one pointed concentration, that is the extraordinary insight of Vipassana, it is here that one finds the initial entry point that is common to all the three vehicles. Now here three vehicles refers to the Shravakayana, then the Pratega Buddhayana, I mean like there are different ways of putting it, but this can also be like understood in, in, in two ways. First is uh, Shravakyana, Pratik Buddhayana, Bodhisattva Yana, or Pratimoksha prati, prati, uh, Vau, this Pratimoksha who kind of wishes for achieve self liberation, and then the Bodhisattva Yana, and then the secret mantra Yana, that is Vajrayana. So, what, what Mipham Ruche says is the combination of calm abiding, Shamatha, and Vipassana, the union of these two when one has achieved kind of some kind of stability, that is the entry point of all the three yanas. So then we move on to the significance of practice. All illusory phenomena which arise interdependently have never arisen since the very dawn of time. And so in emptiness, the lack of phenomenal identity, they are beyond extremes such as sameness or difference. This absolute space of great indivisible quality, equality is also known as the essence of sugatas. Once it is realized, one finds the great nirvana that abides in neither existence nor quiescence. This is supremely pure and blissful, the great unconditioned, totally permanent, the self, great self-identity. These are its transcendent and unsurpassable qualities. This is the theme of the highest secret essence tantras, the all-pervading space of ultimate co-emergent bliss. It is also referred to as naturally arising wisdom, a state in which all phenomena have total perfection. So I won't read all of it. And uh, um, uh, the in the last kind of uh, part of it, where Nifarma Bucci points out, the more familiar you become with this practice of thoroughly purifying activities of the mind, the more the afflictions will diminish and the subtler the kleshas will become. This will make it easier to practice shamatha and just like gold that is treated in fire, so it becomes malleable and ready to craft, mind will be refined once it is free from attachment. Imagine if someone were to offer plentiful gifts to the tree jewels for a thousand godly years, it is said in the sutras that the merit of this generosity is surpassed by the merit of even a moment's reflection on impermanence, emptiness, and selflessness. This is because the teachings say that to recite the four seals of Mahayana Dharma is equivalent to understanding the teachings in the 84,000 sets of sections of dharma if you meditate well on the points explained here 
So they, since they bring together the key points of many thousands of sutras, you will easily gain the treasure of knowing perfectly the profound and vast. The liberation and liberation will swiftly follow in its wake. So Mipar um, Mambuche sums up the, the importance of reflection on these four aspects of meditation that leads to the meditation upon emptiness. So I think the text itself is quite simple and uh, easy to follow, very practical. Every, anybody can do it, uh, provided um, one understand one has some kind of background in these uh, concepts of multiplicity, um, impermanence, suffering, and then selflessness. So I think with this, uh, without taking much time, I will um, pass it to the next speaker. Thank you, uh, Kenpo. Um, I believe that uh, we just found out that you have a little bit more time than we initially thought you have. So this is excellent news. Okay, now may I, if you guys don't mind, may I welcome Venerable Sunim. Uh, please um, kindly share your knowledge and uh, ways to meditate. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, nice to be here. Nice to see you all. Um, my approach to meditation is through, you know, my experience and the teachings I received from my teachers. And what I've discovered is that you know, even within Buddhism, there are many approaches to meditation. And all of them are equally valid and helpful. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, I got asked when I came back to, Mal to Malaysia, and quite a few people asked me this, what's your Dharma door? You know, which means that what's your method of meditation? And that's the first time I've ever encountered this question. And the meaning behind that is, what's the best meditation method? Okay, what is the best one? I want the best one, the quickest path, mm -hmm. quickest way. And actually, what is the best meditation? The best meditation is the one that you will do regularly. That's all. It doesn't matter what it, vipassana, zen, mindfulness, whatever. You just have to do it. So for me, uh, meditation in terms of definition is, I like to make it simple in my mind because I can't remember a lot of things. So it's easier for me to remember this. Meditation is the intention to pay attention. Intention to pay attention. Moment to moment with openness, acceptance, and curiosity without judgments or expectations. That to me encapsulates what meditation uh, is for me anyway. So it sounds simple. But actually, it's not easy because why? Our mind is really complicated. It's a mess, basically. It's a mess. So when you do meditation, what you're doing is taking your mind for training. It's like taking your mind to the gym, your mind gym, and you're training your mind to be more uh, attentive, to be more mindful, to be more aware. And when you go to the gym normally to exercise, you have to make an effort. You know, if you're not sweating, you're not trying hard enough. You're, either you're not trying hard enough or you're kind of faking it. So it requires some effort. But as the Buddha said, the middle way, you're not striving. Neither are you so relaxed that you fall asleep. So it's somewhere in the middle. And that middle, you have to find this sort of Goldilocks zone, you have to find it. So simple, but not easy. And it's mind training, like going to the gym. And uh, in Zen, we have a very kind of simple uh, phrase that we that's coined by the uh, past masters it's called Chik Chi Shim, that's in Korean, directly pointing to mind. So what is who are you? What is mine? So that 
that again sounds simple, but it's also not easy. So the good thing about meditation is that it works, whether or not you believe it or believe that it works or you don't believe it works. It will work either way. It's like going to the gym or training to run. You know, I don't believe this gym work is any good. But actually, if you do it, it works. So the important thing is to actually do it, to practice meditation. And as uh, I think this is what Pema Chodron said, she's a great Tibetan nun, really great teacher. Uh, one of the best teachers around, I think. We meditate not to become better meditators. We meditate to become better at life, to live our lives better as human beings, to be more compassionate, to be more wise, to be more kind, to be less judgmental, all these kind of positive attributes. So that is actually what meditation uh, in daily life is really all about, you know. It's not about getting to some special state of mind. It's how, how, how do you live your life as a human being after you meditate? Are you still the same jerk? Or are you a nicer jerk? <laughs> like, you know, I'm, I'm still a bit of a jerk. So hopefully not as much as before. So that's the thing. And uh, the thing about meditation working, whether you, whether you believe it works or not, uh, there's research being done in it. And it's shown to be true. Research done uh, by Oxford uh, Mindfulness Center on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And they found that as long as people did it, whether they believe it or not, it works. And the interesting thing is they found that even if you have great faith in meditation, you, you can talk, uh, you know, talk the socks off, uh, I can't remember the analogies, but you, but you don't do it, it doesn't work. So the point is to actually practice the meditation, then it'll help you, it'll help you in your life. So that's really all it is, to actually do it regularly. And I like to say, do it daily-ish, that means you know, especially if you're in lay life and you have a lot of conflicting demands in your time, you may not like me. I, you know, my my job is to practice, so I do it every day. But you may have conflicting demands in time. Maybe somebody fell sick. You got too much work at work. Too much at work. But as long as you do it most days, that will really help you. So that's the thing. Don't don't be too hard on yourself. Also, don't be too lazy with practice. The thing is to find a middle way, again, as the Buddha would say. So, uh, yeah, that's all I want to say. I just want to reiterate, it is really about intention, to pay attention, moment to moment, and have some openness, acceptance about whatever appears in your experience, Good or bad, doesn't matter, it's still meditation. And have some curiosity about it, like, what is this? And then, of course, let go of your judgments and any expectations of what you think meditation should be. In fact, many great teachers said the best way to meditate is not to have an idea about meditation at all. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Our are uh, now maybe uh, Giuliano, um, Professor Giuliano. Thank you for waiting to share your thoughts. Uh, please. Thank you. thank you for inviting me and thank you for letting me be here. It's uh, it's an honor again. Uh, so, okay, I I will try to share something myself too. For, um, uh, last time uh, we discussed together um, uh, how actually emptiness may work in terms of uh, uh, theory and practice in a way, and now we are uh, focusing most on practice. And uh, I think that we said last time also that there is, um, I would say, a description of emptiness, and on the other hand, a way of using emptiness in order to empty 
the mind from uh, from the finance mostly so in uh, in uh, the pali tradition uh, i would say in the pali canonical text and to to a good extent in the pali commentarial tradition we have this uh, twofold uh, approach to emptiness which is one is to use a description of reality in order to to understand reality and to free the mind this way and another one is a direct way to free the mind by means of purification and it is sometimes called uh, emptying the mind it's, uh, itself so uh, this time i was thinking of uh, sharing just the basic framework of uh, the so-called satipatthanas so the uh, applications or if we want to say instruments of mindfulness attention sati and mm, to see how actually they pave the path to um, to a meditation on, on emptiness um, i think uh, uh, i hope actually that, that we'll have uh, they will have uh, other uh, meetings where we can discuss uh, more in depth the uh, i would say that the application of uh, these meditative techniques uh, uh, to to emptiness itself but i think that uh, first we need to to see how the framework uh, the framework works and um, yes and i would say actually i hope there will be uh, time today to to say something more but now i just want to show this um, this uh, basic instructions and that we can uh, comment together uh, in the discussion today. I hope that we'll have time for a discussion uh, together. So, um, uh, first, um, I would like to say that uh, these uh, four Saripatanas work according to uh, three, uh, I would say, three guidelines. Uh, one is uh, the emphasis on, uh, on effort. Which is also be in being uh, uh, stressed by uh, previous speakers, Kempola uh, and Sunim. Uh, so effort is uh, is uh, paramount, of course. And then there is a second part, which is mostly based on knowledge, awareness, you know, sampajanya. Uh, and then uh, there is there is a part of uh, letting go, uh, 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 an actual removal of uh, attachment uh, craving and uh, aversion hatred uh, with regard to the to the world with all the entire experience uh, so this said with these uh, uh, three uh, foundations we may think of uh, we may actually look at the at the techniques uh, in a little more in detail so we have the kaya nupassana anupassana uh, i translated here as using a standard translation, so contemplation, but it's actually um, watching, observing uh, meticulously. No, anu means a bit by bit, following no, one at a time, one piece at a time, no, so in, in, in detail, thoroughly. No, so observing the body, feelings, the mind, and the dhammas. No? We'll see what dhamma, uh, the word dhamma means in this, uh, in this case, dhamma in Pali and Dharma in Sanskrit. Uh, so th these are the, the, the four fields uh, wherein uh, mindfulness is applied and they become instruments in order to develop mindfulness in itself. And uh, without them actually it is considered as impossible to uh, really appreciate and understand uh, emptiness. So basically the, the the approach is based on a developing of, uh, I would say, maybe better attention uh, um, is a way to define it. So uh, not just an analytical um, uh, analytical reflection on, uh, on reality in order to see emptiness, but developing attention in order to let the reality of emptiness emerge by itself. So we can see next, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, techniques uh, how they develop in detail one by one so we can consider the four uh, uh, satipatthanas uh, anytime are um, used in these ways 
One is by uh, observing, for instance, the body internally, externally, and both, both internally and externally. And uh, then there is another method, which is to, uh, this one is, a, is a more closely related to, to emptiness, because it's to pay attention to the arising, the ending, and both the arising and ending of the object and whatever emerges within the object. And so this is very important because in this arising and ceasing, there is actually, I would say, the secret of emptiness in a way, or the texture of emptiness. Uh, and then there is another one, which is a, a little more basic. Uh, that means that um, uh, sati, mindfulness, is exerted in order to develop sati. So it's not, uh, it's not directed to the, an understanding of reality, understanding of impermanence and the selflessness of reality, but it is just to develop sati. So the instrument is exerted because it is clear that the instrument is, is, um, is very important. This uh, mental factor, uh, sati, this uh, wholesome kusala mental factor is important and therefore must be developed for its own sake, not only as an instrument for something else. We can go on and see uh, the first Satipatthana, which is itself made of uh, various parts. And um, uh, Kempola already uh, mentioned that, that uh, we have, um, I would say, a more Samatha approach, no, a more, uh, uh, an approach based mostly on, uh, on uh, peacefulness, concentration, and so on. And, uh, and there is, uh, a, there is a, a more analytical, uh, or I would say, an approach which is more, uh, more based on seeing, actually seeing reality. And we can see all of them here, uh, even in this first uh, Satipatthana. For instance, Anapanasati, of course, uh, helps develop more concentration. Now, this is the, the mindfulness directed to in-breath and out-breath. Then we have, uh, uh, I would say, a lighter uh, level of attention, which is applied to the four postures of the body, when one is lying, uh, sitting, uh, uh, standing, walking. Um, there is, there is uh, Sampajani exerted in ordinary life. So that means that these uh, uh, techniques are continuously applied. There is the so-called Patikula or Asubba, uh, Manasikara or Kamatana, so the paying attention uh, to the impurity of the body, and this is the contemplation of the, of the parts of the body. There is the Datu Manasikara, and I hope that we'll have more time to discuss that, because I think this is the closest that we have related to emptiness. The, uh, this is a method that is used in other, on other occasions in the, in the suttas to discuss directly, precisely, uh, uh, emptiness and to help the mind to let go of the impurities that prevent from seeing emptiness. And then there is a, a, a datu manasikara, meaning the, the, um, the attention paid to the four elements, the four mahabhutas, the great elements. Uh, so, uh, um, um, earth, patavi, um, uh, apo, uh, water, so the, the fluidity of, uh, of uh, everything, and uh, uh, heat and wind. And uh, uh, these uh, elements uh, um, mm, represent actually what is rupa. So this, uh, uh, the contemplation of these elements is very important because it's where the emptiness of whatever is material can be understood. And by seeing the emptiness in what is material, of course, it can be seen emptiness also in what is mental, in mental factors. And, and uh, the last one of this series is the Navasivatika, uh, uh, Navasi the nine contemplation in the cemeteries, uh, when actually the, the idea, the image, the actual image, or even the, um, even the idea itself, you know, the, the, uh, say the, uh, if, um, the imagination of a body uh, during uh, decay is contemplated 
and uh, at each step of uh, of decay uh, of the decomposition the uh, meditator is supposed to uh, to consider that he or she himself herself is not different from that body as the same nature and this is the uh, kaya nupassana the next one uh, vedana anupassana contemplation of feeling you can see that uh, is quite simple and divided in in uh, the basic nature of feelings so uh, pleasant unpleasant uh, uh, neither pleasant nor unpleasant so uh, neutral and uh, um, more physical and more mental so coarse and subtle and uh, the third one is about the the I would say moods or the states of the mind. So it's a chitta nupassana. You can see next slide. And uh, basically, the the um, the disciple is supposed to observe um, the possibility of uh, possibilities of the mind, whether it is liberated, non liberated, contracted, uh, scattered, distracted, expanded, um, with or without, this is the beginning and this is a fun, uh, fundamental part, with or without uh, kilesas or kleshas, so the main, uh, main afflictions of the mind, you know, greed, hatred, and delusion. And this is the uh, third one. The fourth one actually uh, is a list of teachings that uh, are to be explored uh, and depending on the nature of these um, uh, of these dhammas, uh, the disciple should um, also observe the letting go. Uh, if we are talking about the akusala, the unwholesome dhammas, or the uh, the development, the cultivation of the wholesome, healthy, good kusala dhammas. So. Uh, in the beginning, we have the Panchanivaranas, the five hindrances, and they had to be let go of. And one observes the mind when let's go of these uh, hindrances, these obstacles. And with the Kandas, we have the Kandas. Uh, so the, I would say the, the, the whole Namarupa, no? so the whole mind matter uh, aggregate of five aggregates we can continue with the next one so we have the the sense experience the sense sense basis the six sense uh, entrances basis or spheres ayatanas uh, so the uh, five senses plus the sixth sense the mind on the intellect mano and we have the Bojangas, the seven factors of awakening uh, that, of course, are to be not only contemplated, but also developed, cultivated. And one observes the cultivation and the full, uh, uh, the full completion, the full uh, um, growing of these factors. So we have uh, mindfulness itself. We have the investigation of the Dhammas. Dhamma Vishaya, the one that becomes uh, Dhamma Nupassana and so on. And this is also the basis of Abhidhamma. Uh, virya, effort, piti, so this excited joy, Pasadi, relaxation, Samadhi, concentration, and Dupekka, equanimity. And then uh, we, have, we have the four truths. So even uh, this part, which is actually, we know that it is the first teaching of the Buddha, uh, is this one itself an object of uh, an application of mindfulness. So the attention has to be paid to them. And this way, actually, there is a, there is a growing in mindfulness. Because remember that each Saripatthana can be developed first to understand reality. To understand the arising and ceasing of the objects and also to uh, to develop uh, sati mindfulness itself so this is the 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 general uh, the general uh, outline of the of the 
meditation in the, in the Pali Suttas. Uh, since I already seen that there are there are questions for for all of us actually. I think that maybe it would be good if I stop here and I leave time for questions. I guess. Uh, you are you are muted, Rama. Uh, thank you, Ajahn Giuliano. Um, uh, uh, before we go to the questions, actually, uh, there's a request for uh, the list of material, I think, um, that you have spoken about. Uh, right. Yes. Maybe you can address that. Well, OK, there are, there are, uh, there are several texts, of course, on the Satipatthanas. So. I think that the, mo um, the most popular ones are the books written by by Bikwanalayo. I would suggest also there is a beautiful book, uh, not only on the Satipatthanas, but on the, the 37 uh, Wings or Factors of Awakening uh, by Rupert Gatin, uh, which uh, the title is The Path to Awakening. And I think that that one maybe is uh, um, being a specifically focus on the Pali tradition, I think is the maybe the most detailed book that comes to my mind. But I would also recommend the, the, the books by uh, Bikwa Analayo, uh, because at least the first one is, is, uh, is on the Satipatthanas. And there are also some comparisons with the, with the Chinese tradition, uh, with the with, uh, um, Chinese translation. So one may actually see uh, where there is some uh, uh, different interpretations of the of uh, each one, so yes, I think so. The, these ones, I, I uh, even before that, I think I will recommend reading the the text themselves. So in order in order to to study the Mahasatipatthana Sutta, for instance, I will recommend reading, reading, and reading the Mahasatipatthana Sutta. We have uh, various translation. And uh, I would also recommend uh, studying some Pali to understand them better uh, in depth. OK. Uh, we have uh, our, a question that came up uh, from the same audience uh, uh, on the contemplation of uh, dharmas. During meditation, do we need to fake the arising of those dhammas to observe and investigate, or do we investigate whatever actual dhammas that arise during the meditation, during our meditation? I don't understand this. But to fake the arising of those dhammas, I'm not sure I understand what it means to fake the arising of those dhammas. Uh, uh, so for for the for the other part, I think uh, I think I can say that okay. First of all, uh, uh, I think that uh, very good instructions are found in the Visuddhimagga for the order to use and so on. Uh, in this sense, I, uh, my understanding is that it can be done uh, intentionally. So one may actually refer to a specific dhamma. So we can. Uh, uh, for instance, a kandanupassana can be done by itself. Now we have, we actually have a text that uh, focuses uh, uh, only on the uh, contemplation of the kandas on the of the aggregates. You know? So it can be done by itself uh, deliberately, intentionally, only based on that. But it can be done in different ways. Uh, we have, uh, for instance, uh, um, a sequence of uh, suttas on anicca, dukkha, uh, upassana, and anatta, upassana, in the Samyutta Nikaya. And they all have, uh, the, uh, these three have um, the kandas as objects, but they have the uh, paradigm of, uh, of uh, anicca, dukkha, and anatta to contemplate the, the kandas, the aggregates. So this is another method. But my understanding is that they should be done intentionally taking one by one so this is not just whatever whatever arises um, uh, uh, because i think that the okay we may say that in a way the four truths for instance arise but uh, since that we are talking about teachings of the buddha i think that the mind should be averted to them so they are chosen 
in a way, I assume that all the four Satipatthanas are chosen for each practice. In, in, the, in, in the Abhidhamma tradition, tradition the, the, the task is given to the disciple according to the kind of mind that the, the, the disciple has. So, for instance, if, uh, if, um, if the disciple has a very quick mind, Dhammanupassana is recommended. The mind is actually, uh, I would say, uh, less quick in a way. Uh, Kayanupassana could be recommended. So the, the, this depends on the on the on on the teacher. The teacher assigns a task according to the kind of inclination uh, of the mind in the disciple. So this is how okay. uh, how it works. So in, in this case, of thinking of the contemporary uh, practice, I would think that. Uh, that the indication of a teacher would be would be very important. Okay, uh, thank you, Ajahn Giuliano. Now, we, I mean, maybe I can start the uh, my mischievous part, which is to to go into the dialogue between the different traditions. So maybe I will uh, throw out my first question uh, for all of you, please. Um, we, we last time we uh, started talking about what is emptiness, right? I hope uh, you remember and also. You, your brief answers because the time was limited. Today, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to go on a tangent or actually the opposite side. What is not emptiness? Uh, you, know, you know, so kind of it's it's going to be a, a, a fun discussion, I believe. Maybe uh, any taker here first, please uh, feel free. Please, Kenpo. <clears throat> I think uh, last time I remember making one statement when we were talking about um, emptiness and uh, I made one st statement uh, which uh, very much um, in a very simple way um, the essential of what emptiness is and what is not emptiness. So um, the statement was everything is interdependent and nothing is independent. So when we say nothing is independent and on the other side, everything is interdependent. So when nothing is independent is more from the negation, uh, negative uh, aspect, whereas everything is interdependent is more from the positive side or what it is there. So, uh, if you if you were to ask, I mean, it's from this way. It's very clear that what is not emptiness is like, if if you feel that things are independent, whether it is your person, whether it's the person you are talking about, whether you as a person, as independent entity, or your feelings, or your emotions, or your perception, or your opinion or your ideology, it can be anything. And there's a strong kind of very much strong uh, grasping to it that this is it, you know, that uh, this is something independent, you know, an independent identity, and this is separate from others, you know. So that uh, very notion that things are independent, whatever it may be, uh, that actually shows that one is really far away from what is the reality. So there's nothing which is independent. Everything is interdependent. Okay. So if, if there is um, something which is not empty, something which is not, uh, something which is not interdependent, then uh, it can't function. It can't function. So therefore, like my answer would be, what is not emptiness is there is nothing which is not empty because everything is interdependent. You can't really pinpoint out any one phenomenon which is independent. Thank you, Kenpo. Um... Uh, would uh, Venerable Sunim and uh, Ajahn Giuliano, would you agree or you have something to add on this, please? Uh, 
कुछ नहीं Is that emptiness or not emptiness? I ask you. <laughs> well, um, from uh, Ken Po's answer, then everything is interdependent. So definitely, that is emptiness. Well, if you make emptiness, you get emptiness. If you make not emptiness, it's not emptiness. So Buddha. Said in the um, Flower Garland Sutra, mind, whole universe is created by mind alone. Okay, so very interesting. Good question, by the way. Uh, points to something, but the only answer I can give you is this. That's Zen style. <laughs> uh, okay, I will have to contemplate further. And uh, maybe Juliano, you have some tangent or agreement on this? Yeah, kind of agreement. Uh, I, um, it's quite difficult to say so what is emptiness, what is not emptiness. No, I think that. What is not emptiness is the is what we perceive as not emptiness. No? So it comes to my mind, that, but I, I I do hope that we'll have another session together to discuss that. There, there is a text, there is a Pali text, the Chula Sunyata Sutta, for instance, that discusses the 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 I would say the dichotomy of uh, singleness or unity on one side and emptiness on the other side. And provides a meditation to go from the latter to the to the to emptiness, you know, so to the to the sense of uh, of you of something, you not know, the to the somethingness to emptiness, and there is a progressive path, uh, very well detailed. So, uh, but basically, what I would say is that the mistake uh, lies in uh, sanya, which is a perception of singleness. So uh, if I can try to use the, the vivid graphic example provided by Sunim, the finger, I can perceive it as one, I can per uh, perceive it as empty. So I can distinguish the finger from all the rest around me, or I can see that connected with all the things around me. And for instance, uh, somebody would see the finger in the screen. Now, so if you see the screen, so uh, whatever appears is just part of the screen. I distinguish that just because I want to distinguish that, perceive that difference within the screen. I don't know if, if um, anyone has ever observed animals when they look at the screen, when they look at TV. There are some animals that actually like cats, they follow whatever, whatever happens in the screen. So I saw cats watching uh, a, a tennis match by following the, the ball. So you see the cat that moves the eyes. Uh, uh, other animals, for instance, dogs, uh, they, they, they don't care. They see just that there is a screen. So they don't have this distinction of singleness within the screen itself. So, I, uh, so uh, uh, basically uh, speaking, I would say it's, uh, um, it is described as a matter of sanya perception. And sanya may, may lead to a mistake. The, the 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 solution uh, provided more or less is uh, to manasikara and amanasikara so averting the mind and taking the mind away from that perception of singleness that way one may may see what is beyond the, that singleness and that is emptiness so the appearance uh, could be singleness but the reality behind is uh, emptiness Thank you, Ajahn Giuliano. I think uh, more or less uh, we all agree on this point. So I'll go to my next uh, question is, uh, we generally talk about emptiness as, you know, emptiness itself. How How is uh, compassion come into connection or relation to emptiness? I think this is uh, an essential point to a lot of practitioners and, and all of us as a sentient beings as well. Anyone, uh, please? Uh, 
Uh, sorry, I didn't get your point actually. Can you repeat that? Sure. I mean, how is how does compassion come into play in emptiness? On the or on the topic of emptiness. That's a that's a very good question actually. Um, normally in the in the teachings, um, what is actually mentioned in the in them is when one uh, understands and realizes emptiness, then what happens is uh, one really sees deeply about like how um, mm -hmm. lack of knowing or realizing emptiness uh, leads to a lot of suffering and pain, you know, uh, for beings. And the very reason why uh, beings are deluded is because not knowing emptiness, not realizing emptiness. So therefore, like the moment one realizes, understands, understand and realizes emptiness, then compassion for others kind of automatically kind of arises. And that is that is because of actually seeing that how without the lack of um, knowledge of emptiness, the lack of wisdom on the ultimate reality of phenomena leads to a great suffering and great pain in beings. So automatically compassion arises. Of course, um, again, like in terms of developing compassion, they are also kind of, uh, um, uh, there are questions about like, uh, how does one go like into uh, developing wisdom? Does it kind of, does development of wisdom uh, depend on developing compassion or vice versa? So there's a lot of question, uh, discussion on that. So I think like uh, the, the teachings actually mentioned that both can be kind of possible, like, you know, developing compassion, compassion, through compassion, developing wisdom, because when you talk about compassion, and compassion is the wish to relieve uh, others from pain. And in order to relieve others from pain, the understanding or realization of wisdom mm -hmm. within oneself in, and, and in others is so important. So therefore, like, then one yearns to develop wisdom. So therefore, compassion leading to development of wisdom. And then again, like from wisdom, again, developing com developing compassion is just what, what I explained before. So both can, uh, how to say, can happen is possible. Both are possible. Um, but both are very important aspects of the 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 path and and many a times it is mentioned that you know both are like two wings of a bird and if if you really want to achieve supreme enlightenment these two are uh the must like you know the uh, sometimes method is called compassion and wisdom and compassion method and wisdom or whether we call it method and wisdom or compassion and wisdom. Uh, so what happens is if one develops compassion but lacks wisdom, then um, one might fall into the realm of samsara because uh, one lacks wisdom, and wisdom that knows the reality of all phenomena. But if one has wisdom, develop wisdom, but lacks compassion, then it can lead to what we call the uh, the other extreme of nirvana, e extreme of peace, you know. So therefore, like from the Mahayana perspective and Vajrayana perspective, these two are so important, like two wings of a bird. Thank you, Kenpo. Uh, Venerable Sunim, do you have uh, something on this? Um, I think uh, Venerable Kenpo covered it very well. Compassion is wanting to relieve suffering or pain that you see in others also in yourself so that's a very core practice of buddhism however you can see people who are compassionate not only in buddhism but in all aspects of life all different religions all rich poor 
educated, uneducated. So I would say compassion is a, is a human attribute, but it is the, there's, you don't have to have a prerequisite of emptiness to practice compassion, okay? It may enhance your sense of compassion if you have an experience of emptiness, but it's not a prerequisite. You can practice, you can be compassionate to others. Yeah, I'm sure you have felt compassion for other people, uh, even though you may not have experienced emptiness, uh, all of us. So we know what it is to be compassionate. We like it when people are compassionate to us, and we also feel uh, good when we uh, do some compassion action. So I think that's the key thing. Compassion is an activity, not a feeling. So that's very important to, to understand that is something that you do to help relieve the suffering of others. And of course, wisdom comes into it. But uh, I think important to realize that you can be compassionate. You can practice being compassionate, uh, basically, as, as part of your practice, without having to say, oh, I've got to experience emptiness first. And you look at, read the books that the Dalai Lama has written, many books on compassion. He says, if you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. Right? That's his famous quote. So that's really what it is, you know. Like compassion is a altruistic expression of our human nature. Uh, of course, it gets covered up with a lot of delusions and, uh, you know, uh, confused thinking. But if we practice compassion, then you will experience some happiness in yourself and also other people will be happier too. So yeah, that's all I can add to, to that. But it's very good practice. Yes, um, I, I, I picked up uh, something which maybe I can make a small bridge. You said um, altruism. So that's pretty much relates on selflessness and emptiness directly, I believe. Would you agree on this point? Altru Ooh, good question. I, I don't know. Do you have to, can you be altruistic without having? I think altruism means, you know, doing something without expecting something in return, doing something positive for somebody, for others, or, you know, for your community, for this world, having this sense of altruism. And again, I think Perhaps, as you say, there may be an element of emptiness in it. Uh, but you can practice altruism. You can see many altruistic people, you know, people who are very selfless, as you say, uh, who may not have this idea of emptiness. Okay. So, but it's very important. Altruism, compassion. Again, like uh, I refer to the Dalai Lama. I mean, he always talks about uh, practicing altruism compassion, human ethics is the other one that he talks about a lot. And I think these are the key teachings for us right now, especially when we're facing this climate crisis. You know, if we don't practice this, humanity will have a very, very hard time to survive in the next 20, 30 years. So these are very key practices for us to think of ourselves as a common people, common humanity. Sorry, I diverged a bit. Thank you, Venerable. Uh, Juliano, sorry, um, we have very limited time, um, so please keep it short, and um, maybe yeah. you have something to add on this topic, and then we will conclude right after. Okay, so as short as possible. Uh, so I would say that uh, I agree on all what was that before, in the sense that I I think that, in a way, we have, um, uh, I would say, an embryonic compassion in some way and embryonic understanding of emptiness so we can develop emptiness uh, the understanding of emptiness by developing compassion and vice versa we can uh, develop compassion by understanding more and more emptiness 
and I think that one of the ways it, they are related to each other is that when we see no actually barrier division, uh, separation, no? so when, uh, when uh, the idea of self, of thingness, no? that there is something isolated and so on, no? when these ideas fade out, uh, um, well, compassion should be something quite spontaneous because we, we, have, uh, we have a sense of closeness to others, to other beings. Oh, that's uh, quite profound and concise. So I think uh, from what I picked up, it's like uh, openness. It's, you know, it's like genuine openness, right? I mean, the compassion and emptiness, that's maybe it can overlap. What do you think about that, Julian? Yeah, openness could be one way to describe it. You know? So we, we, we open because there is it's the opposite of a contraction. You know? uh, self is a contraction. Actually, uh, one of the uh, definitions of uh, of a self is a, a, a panda pandita or spandita, which is a contraction actually, you know? so, uh, like a, a spasm. Self is a spasm, and when there is openness, the spasm is relaxed, and that there is compassion there. What is a field for compassion? Okay, uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, I think uh, we will go to the concluding part. Uh, I must thank all of you for your uh, generous time in helping myself, of course, for sure, and all the audience here, especially them, uh, in having better understanding of these important topics. And uh, I think these are very profound uh, topics and sometimes uh, can be a little bit difficult to have a meaningful dialogue. And, and I look forward to more of these, of course. Um, before we end, uh, uh, we will do some uh, uh, announcements regarding the upcoming uh, events. Um, so uh, we will have one of the Venerable Sunim again. Um, you're very kind. You will be uh, hopefully uh, nothing will happen uh, between now and then. Of course, impermanent on 7th of November, uh, it's a Sunday or a GMT plus eight at start at 8 p.m. as usual or or London time. It's GMT plus one, 1 p.m. on the, the Zen of practicing patience. Wow, that's a very profound topic. I definitely like patience and I would love to uh, to learn about it as well. That would be very interesting. and. Um, and I don't think we have any uh, other events announcement at this point. Um, so maybe we will invite first Venerable Suname, followed by Kenpo and then Giuliano to say the concluding prayers, sure. and then we can end the session. Thank you. The four great vows. Sentient beings are numberless. We vow to save them all. The illusions are endless. We vow to cut through them all. The teachings are infinite. We vow to learn them all. The Buddha way is inconceivable. We vow to attain it. Thank you, Venerable. May I welcome Kenpo? Chanjo Senjo Rinpoche, Maje Panan Kijuji, Kewa Nyamba Mewaya, Kone Kondo Kewa Shu. Do you have any brief translation for that, Kenpo? May the precious Bodhicitta arise where it has not come to be and wherever it has arisen may it never uh, fade but flourish even increase further more and more thank you and ajan juliano please sabba papa sakaranam kusala sopa sampada sashitta paridapanam etam buddhana sasanam the not doing of anything uh, wrong, evil, unwholesome, uh, the undertaking of what is good, wholesome, the purification of the mind, that is the destruction, the teaching of the Buddhas. Thank you uh, very much uh, all and uh, wishing you all a great day uh, because we are all different in different time zones and uh, again, homage and big thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.